Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, welcome to my talk uh, with the title Surviving the Sum Apocalypse of Connected Devices, with the subtitle HTML Hypermedia APIs and Adaptive Web Design. So, my name is Gustav Nielsen Kotte. I work at JWay in uh, Malmö. And uh, this summer, I wrote a blog post called Combining HTML Hypermedia APIs and Adaptive Web Design. And it got some uh, nice feedback from the REST community on Twitter, for example, by Jon Moore, by Mike Admersend, and also Roy Fielding retweeted a link to my blog post. So I believe I have something important to tell you. So this talk will be about two problems. First, how can we scale the development of apps? And secondly, how can we make our web work on every browser? So these problems aren't very new, but they are becoming more and more important, as I will show you. And I suggest that we start building HTML hypermedia APIs to make it easier to scale apps, and that we start using adaptive web design and progressive enhancement to make our web work on each browser. And then, if we combine HTML hypermedia APIs and adaptive web design, we will see that it's kind of the perfect combination. They two work very well together. And I will also show you that you can have your API and your web served from the same endpoint to be the same code base. So, uh, today, a traditional computer, like the one you see here, isn't the only interactive computing device that we use. We also use laptops, netbooks, smartphones, tablets, e-readers, and smart TVs, for example. Likewise, a traditional computer, like the one we see here, isn't the only way we access the web with a web browser today. We also use laptops, netbooks, smartphones, tablets, e-readers, and smart TVs to access the web. And we will, be, we will continue to see more and more ways to access the web. And more importantly, behind these question marks here are devices that we as developers know nothing about yet. And perhaps they haven't even been, been invented yet. But we can be pretty sure that there will be more device types. The number of device types will continue to grow, and uh, many new devices connected to the web will have a web browser inside of them. So, in general, the, we have a growing number of the actual connected physical devices. So, uh, estimates, estimated number from GigaOM says that today we have 5 billion devices connected to the web. And then Intel predicts in, uh, that in 2015, two years from now, we will have 15 billion devices connected to the web. And then uh, the CEO of Ericsson predicts that in 10 years from now, we will have 50 billion devices connected to the web. So that's, that's like a huge number. <laughs> um, and then, uh, as I showed in the previous slides, the types of devices, uh, the number of types of devices will continue to grow, as we've seen. And then accordingly, the number of platforms uh, that support, can support these types of devices will also grow. For example, we saw uh, a while ago that Ubuntu announced their mobile OS, and Mozilla is doing the same thing. So we see a, a growing number of platforms as well. And then the um, number of actual device types, uh, uh, device mo models, I mean, uh, is growing. For example, if, if you watch on the Android platform, the number of device models are just enormous. Um, and it's kind of like this technology evolves in all directions. So it's not just getting better and better. Well, th that depends on what you mean by better and better. Well, we see some, um, some products on one side of the spectrum, uh, on the top, that products compete on quality. For example, um, many of Apple's products. So they compete on quality, keeping the price relatively fixed. And we can call this a race to the top. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have products that more compete on price, keeping the quality relatively fixed, more of a race to the bottom in some way. And this process is also called commoditization. Now, if this 
system is stable, we will see that this gap here will continue to increase the gap between the best devices and the worst. And we as developers, or at least the, one who, the ones who pay our bills, will like our applications or services to work on the whole spectra of these devices. Um, and furthermore, we, will al we also see that um, when you embed a computer in an already existing thing, for example, the smart TV, these small computers tend to be very low performant, not very good for various reasons. So we kind of get more of the lower end devices than the high end devices, uh, in my perspective. So one example from uh, my reality um, home. Like a while ago, I bought a uh, Raspberry Pi. And I really love that device. It's just a, such a cheap, small computer, 35 bucks. Um, and I use it as a media center connected to my TV so I can stream YouTube movies from my iPhone with AirPlay to Xbox Media Center and then to my TV. And that's perfect. Uh, it's a really nice computer, a re really low performance, but the graphics card is unproportionately good so I can watch really high, um, high resolution movies on my TV. Um, but then, if I want to browse the web, my experience is a somewhat different kind. Because I have uh, two problems. Either I go into terminal mode and start browsing the web with a text-based web browser. And, for example, links or links. And these browsers don't support JavaScript. And many pages today rely on JavaScript for serving content. You know, single page apps or just regular apps that relies on JavaScript. So then I start an uh, X-Window server firing up a graphical browser. And the performance of Linux inside of a Raspberry Pi isn't very nice. It's very good. I can have like one or two tabs open at most. And then if the page I surf to is very big in content or in CSS or JavaScript, a lot of things happening, the page is really slow. So as a Raspberry Pi user and owner, I would like the web to be, have a better web experience on my Raspberry Pi. So that's kind of a, an example from, from, my, from my side um, of a low performance device accessing the web. So now to another example about the, the fragmentation uh, of different platforms. So uh, here we see the, the current market share of smartphones numbers from uh, GigaOM, from Comscore, I mean. And we see that Android is, uh, well, if the colors were correct, we would see that Android has 54% uh, of uh, the market. And this is the actual number of physical sold devices. So it's not revenue, it's just number of devices. And then Apple has, a, has 35%, and the rest is shared, the rest 11% are shared by Microsoft and BlackBerry. Um, now, this looks kind of nice. We just have two platforms to support, essentially. So let's zoom in on the Android uh, part here. And we see that the Android fragmentation of uh, device types is just huge. And some of these device types, device models, are, of course, certified by Google. But, I mean, how, how can you make sure that your web will work in all of these devices? or device models. I mean, even, even if you just test 20 of these, you still have, have only covered a third. So, of course, you can run some automated tests on this, on, on every, <laughs> every mobile phone, if you kind of fire up a simulator for that, uh, with, with the screen size and the, the, and the combination of uh, screen size and the platform. But what's the user experience like? Like, does it take like two seconds for every click on a link? That's not very good. Um, what about, uh, for example, CSS bugs due to different screen resolutions? Perhaps you have an automated test that clicks on a button, button but that button might may be hidden below some other element. And then it's impossible for a user, a real user, to click on that button. So you would like uh, to have much less moving parts um, 
for this, uh, for to solve this problem, I think. So the the title of my talk contained uh, the word zombie. So let's talk about zombies here. Uh, it's of course a metaphor. metaphor. But some properties of zombies are that they are they kind of move slow. They are quite hungry for human flesh. They are angry, and they're more more importantly are lots of them. So you can imagine like a horde of low spec Android devices coming to your site or app or service, knocks on your door and like, ooh, we want to access your content. We want to interact with your service. And it's like it's up to you if you want to open the door or not. But as a business owner, it would be probably probably very nice for you to open the door and let them do their thing, right? So we should be kind to zombies. There are there were human beings, once upon a time at least. So, two problems here. How can we scale the development of apps? And how can we make our web work on every browser? And we should ask ourselves a question here. Why would we like to scale the development of apps? And why would we like to, to make our web work on every browser? Perhaps your business or business model doesn't isn't, it's, it's necessary for you to, to do this. And then, then it's just fine if you can control the, the devices uh, that access your site um, and control if you only go for iOS or a single page application, that's fine. But it's, I mean, it's all about the costs versus the benefits here. So what if I told you that if, if you go with um, my proposed solutions here with HTML, Hypermedia APIs and after web design, that the cost will be very low to solve these problems. Well, then you can get like the benefits for free. So it's, but yeah, it's always about the costs versus the benefits, of course. So let's um, talk some about some uh, about the problem of scaling development of apps. So why is this a problem? Well, I think it's a problem because because we have so fat clients. And the reason behind this is that we have so thin APIs today. And uh, if we have so thin APIs, it's because they just serve like data, data from directly from the data store or from the domain model. And then all the business flow, the business knowledge, and the application flow needs to be somewhere. It's not in the API. So it's ending up in all these clients. And that's the reason why, why we have fat clients, because we have really skinny APIs. So it would be much better if we reverse this picture. So we have a fat API containing all the, the business knowledge, all the application flow, all the application logic. And then we can have really skinny clients allowing us to scale out on those, because they will contain less code. So now, how can we go from here to here? What tools do we have? What concepts or ideas can we use? And I think that the only way, uh, the best way to do this is to go pure REST. And I mean uh, level three on the maturity scale of Richardson. Because it's only there on the pure REST level three with hypermedia controls that you can expose application flow and, um, and the processes. None of these lower levels of REST contains ways for you to expose application flow or processes to your clients. So let's talk about hypermedia APIs. Uh, there's a brilliant blog post, I think, by John Moore um, with the title, Using HTML as the media type for your API, where he goes through a lot of advantages why we would like to use HTML as the media type for our API. And the, the first is that HTML contains a lot of hypermedia controls. Uh, another name for that is uh, H factors, hypermedia factors, or even hypermedia affordances. And an ex an example, some examples of these are yeah, an, an AREF in HTML, just a link. And another example is uh, support for non independent updates, which in HTML's case is just a form but a form with a method indicating which verb we should use when we send back the data. Oh, and by the way, we have a URL here pointing 
where, where we should send our data. And then if we look at the input, uh, the first input element here, we see that it kind of represents a property in the business with the name keywords. And it has a type, text, and it also could have a default value or the current value in the system. So this is hypermedia controls, nothing special in HTML, but if you go, if you look at other JSON format, JSON based formats, it's kind of not the same story here. HTML also contains lots of uh, ways to expose rich semantics data structures. And you might not th have thought about this, but the dual element is essentially a bag. So if you want to indicate that your unordered list uh, uh, is, is unordered, you can use the UL element to indicate a bag. And on the same way, an order list is a regular list. Uh, this is like, I'm saying kind of the same thing here, but um, it might, might not be obvious that you have these opportunities. And you can even uh, kind of expose a map with a definition list. But you need a way to expose your domain, your, your properties and your entities. And for that, you can use uh, something called a microformat style. So kind of a semantic web thing, where you um, uh, use the attributes class and IDs to tag up your data, your data elements. For example, we have some element here that is called bugs, and then it contains an unordered list, and we have some metadata ha here that it indicates that we ha it's all the bugs in the system, at least all the bugs that the user is allowed to see. And then we see a, a, an, an element of that the list with a property, title, and another property, description. And then we have an action attached to this bug, which moves the bug, and it moves it to the working state, and it is the next logical state of this uh, bug, if you follow the main flow of the application. But the nicest thing, I think, about HTML is that it's, it's very old. It's almost 20 years old. And it's been standardized over and over again. And kind of everybody knows it. It's like every developer, almost every developer, can identify HTML. Like, oh, this is HTML. And not so, not so many, but many people can actually write proper HTML as well. And even some people that are not developers can identify that, oh, this is HTML. So it's a very, very well-known format. And a, a th kind of a side effect of this is that we have really great tooling support for HTML, both on the th server side and on the client side. So on the server side, you have, um, you have web, uh, web template engines, for example. And also when you develop, you have code editors, which has kind of have a syntax highlighting or even to indicate which elements are valid in different contexts. And then on the client side, you have, of course, parser libraries. But more importantly, you have a tool that lets you to graphically represent the HTML code being sent. And that's called a web browser. Wow. That's something really special and something we can take advantage of. And so if we go back a, go back a few steps, um, there's something called the Pareto Principle, the 80-20 rule, where kind of the principle of optimize where it matters. Um, that's the, yeah, that's uh, kind of what it says. So, for example, could it be that 20% of your customers demand 80% of your feature, new feature requests? Or perhaps that 1% of your customers account for 50% of your revenue? So these are just made-up numbers, but you can do, do the analysis for yourself and then optimize on ba ba based on that data. So then you can have a kind of a, um, an exercise. Could it be that like five or 10% of your use cases are being used 90 or 95% 90 of the time? Then you can kind of treat these use cases differently. So for the most important use cases, the primary use cases, you can build native views to make these views really shine, to make the best use experience possible. And there, then you can use the 
the HTML hypermedia API as a regular API. And then for the secondary use cases, for example, a setting screen, which is not very uh, often uh, accessed, accessed, you can just render an HTML response in a web view. And that kind of makes your use case uh, be developed almost for free. So, for example, you can take the, the Facebook app. Uh, the, how often do you go to another view than the news feed? How many times per year do you go to another view than the news feed? It almost never happens. So why not, for example, put the settings view on, a, on a, just a regular web, web view and uh, d don't care about it more? Then if you see that it's getting accessed more and more and being kind of more important, then you can um, uh, yeah, code something uh, better for it. But you have to have the feedback first and start with the primary use cases. So if you look at alternatives uh, other than HTML for um, the media type for API, you should perhaps ask yourself, what are the hypermedia controls for the media type? Reading and writing data. Does it have rich semantics? Is it extendable, enhanceable, like with microformats and um, um, I, I, uh, having another layer on top of HTML? Um, is it standardized? It is 20 years old. Does kind of eh, the whole world knows about it? And what's the tooling support on the server side and on the client side? So if you want to learn more about hypermedia APIs, I suggest that you uh, read this excellent book by Mike Edmondson called Building uh, Hypermedia APIs with HTML5 and Node. It's a, has, the first chapter is really good. It's about designing hypermedia APIs. And then you have one chapter each for XML hypermedia, JSON hypermedia, and HTML hypermedia. So this was like covering the first problem here. So let's uh, tackle the second one, how to make our web work on every browser. And I think that we should reduce the complexity of web pages and web applications today. We should go for what's called mobile first to serve really simple HTML with just a minimum of CSS and try to avoid JavaScript as much as possible because you want less moving parts that can break in your application. So don't fa say that you shouldn't have any JavaScript in your application. You should, you should try to avoid it as, mus as much as possible, perhaps just 3 or 5K. So I have a demo here for you. Um, it's a fork of Howard Durkin's uh, REST bugs, which is a um, I have HTML hypermedia API that I've forked. Let's see here. Okay, perfect. So here's what I mean. This is a really simple mobile page with, yeah, just uh, maybe 50 lines of CSS or something. And you can add, uh, add a bug to the backlog. And then if you go to the backlog, you see that the bug is here. And you can move, move it to the working state we are working on it. We're done with it. We're moving it to QA. And then we test it, and we can move it to done. And that's it. That's a simple mobile site, a really simple HTML. And I would guarantee you that almost every browser in the world will be possible to, to, to access this web page. So, then, but if we go this route, we have another problem. <laughs> and that is, how can we make a desktop app out of this? Like, the user wouldn't be re really satisfied if you surf in with a laptop with Chrome, in Chrome installed on it and just show what I just showed you. They want kind of a more rich experience. They're used to that. And HTML5 promised us like the rich applications on the web, on the client side. Um, so, like, with really good UX. So, what should we do? Well, 
this problem is very related to something called progressive enhancement, which is a principle for having uh, it's a cross-browser strategy or principle. And it has a pretty nice uh, metaphor attached to it, an escalator, escalator. So the joke goes, an escalator can never break. It can only become stairs, by Mitch Herberg. And when you think about it, it's a really smart invention that you can always go up if it, if it would break. And an elevator, just the opposite, it will just be out of order. So progressive enhancement works kind of on the principal level, and it's almost as old as the web itself. And then you have kind of the implementation, the modern implementation, or the kind of umbrella term, adaptive web design, which is progressive enhancement today with modern technologies. And uh, this is a great book by Aaron Gustafson called Adaptive, Adaptive Web Design that I really recommend. And adaptive web design is an umbrella term, so this contains a lot of ideas, concepts, and technologies. And this is just like the tip of the iceberg. It's a huge, huge topic, and I won't have time to go through even a percent of it today. I will uh, demo some things uh, on this slide in the, the next demo, but um, um, I won't have time to, to cover any detail, details, actually. But if you want to learn more about adaptive design and progressive enhancement, I really recommend you to watch the uh, presentation by Nicholas Sackas called Progressive Enhancement 2.0. It's a really great presentation. And also to look at uh, the site Resource Oriented Client Architecture, the Rocka style, which has some good, good uh, requirements and uh, suggestions for being a good resource oriented client on the web. And it's kind of related to progressive enhancement as well. So, if you look at HTML hypermedia APIs and kind of a mobile first progressive enhancement principle, you see that they have kind of a common goal. Both of them want to serve really minimalistic HTML to the users or to the clients. They just want to send what's really necessary. So, and that kind of made me think, what if the API and the web could be the same thing? Like, if they have the same goal, why not, what, what, what would be the, the, what will stop us from having them as the same thing, being served from the same code base? Well, it's kind of the, the desktop problem, desktop web again, like, will, would it really work? But if you use adaptive web design on top of this, we can see that we can have an API and the mobile web and a desktop web uh, for, served from the same, same endpoint. And a high level view of this would be that native apps go to your API and the most important use cases uh, use, the, use it as API data, parse it and show it to the user. And then the secondary use cases just renders the HTML in a web view. And then for web browsers, for the low spec mobile or yeah, low spec browsers, they can just show the simple HTML being served directly with some tiny amount of CSS. And then for better browsers, you can uh, enhance the, the experience for the users with adaptive web design. And you can even go as, as far as kind of applying the Pareto principle here too. So really invest in uh, in these technologies of adaptive web design for the use case that really matters. And, and one really important thing here is, here is to repeat is that you have no application logic on the client side because all application logic is on the server side. So obviously you have to make some compromises because it's not, it's not just 100% uh, the same thing. It's not a, a simple one-to-one -one mapping, as I will show you. But, so you have to kind of think about it. Does the cost, is the cost less than the benefits? And it could be, for example, for a startup, that it's just, wow, this is a really cheap way to, to move forward. And then three, four, or five years later, you decide to, to split. And then you will have a problem if you have uh, your web and your API as the exactly same endpoint. So, so you have to think about an exit strategy. 
you have to have at least two different host names, two different URLs. One for your web and one for your API. And then, then you, can be, you can split them, separate them at a later stage. Because it would be really hard for, uh, for the clients to just switch server. It would be a difficult problem um, on deployment-wise. Or you can have like, separate instances running at the same time with the same code base. You can kind of separate how you want. But it could be good to separate as, a, at, as far out as possible. So let me show you a, um, a, exam, a demo here of uh, REST bugs with HTML, Hypermedia APIs, and adaptive web design. So this is a somewhat extreme example that I will show you. It's having more of a kind of single page application feel to it. But I want to show you kind of what you can do. So let's go in here again. So, so here's the mobile site again. And if we now make the screen bigger, I kind of ruined my surprise. There's something strange going on here. Okay. So if we make the screen larger, it loads a, a different kind of experience for the user. So here you, you, you show much more data than on the mobile page. And you, so I kind of pulled all the content from the different bug states onto this, this board here. And you can have a kind of snappy interface here. And you can even drag and drop the bugs um, between states. And you can add a bug, and it will end up in the backlog. So I have started a different instance of the same uh, code base on a different port which is my example of showing you that you have different, some kind of different URLs that you can separate on. So this is the, from the API perspective. So I've, re I've uh, removed all the CSS and all the JavaScript, just serving the HTML. And it works exactly as, uh, as the mobile site, except for the styles and JavaScript. Oh, and one more thing. We can, we can send a, so a question, what would happen here from an API's perspective to, for us to be a good API? We would like to send back some kind of status code. And, and we do. We send back a, a, a created 201, which is separate from the application flow from the mobile site, where if we add a bug, we just get the index page. So since I have different URLs here, I can kind of have different application flows depending on if it's API from the API side or the website because we have some kind of different flow going on here. And I just want to uh, f make want to f uh, want you to focus on the links here because I will cover them um, in the, the next few slides. So these links here go to different different uh, bug states. Okay. So, some, um, some client code, some server code, what I just done, what I just showed you. So I just use a uh, polyfill for, uh, for media queries. So media queries is this CSS technique that uh, allows you to have responsive web design, uh, having different CSS rules for different screen sizes and uh, different media, media um, types. Uh, and there's a, a way to access these media queries from JavaScript but it doesn't work in all browsers. But harvey.js is a polyfill that makes it possible for you to get a callback if uh, the user comes to your page with a, 
certain screen size or if it, the screen size uh, gets bigger or smaller. And then, uh, so I have a configuration here called large screen and it, it, on the callback when it gets uh, a large screen, it loads the uh, a minified JavaScript uh, file, my client, and it also loads uh, CSS uh, and removes the old CSS on the mobile page and loads the new one. And then if we go back to uh, a smaller screen size, we just reload the page. And it would perhaps be nice to have some kind of alert box or something to ask the users, user if, if it really wants to if he or she really wants to reload the page. So, and this is kind of where, where the hypermedia uh, goes on in the, in the client. So the links that I ask you to remember that point you to different bug states or bug resources, we access them with jQuery and uh, just t take all the links that isn't, uh, aren't the uh, index link and save them for later, and also the add form, we we'll save for later. And then we'll load a template uh, containing AngularJS markup. Um, and then we just clear the body and bootstrap Angular on the cleared body. So we insert the Angular template inside of the body element. And then for each link that we previously stored, we make an AJAX request for that link. We parse it or traverse it in some way, getting the data that we want, and we populate a view model for Angular, and thus it runs, renders the page. And then we enable hijax to, for the add and remove buttons. So hijack is one of these adaptive web design techniques where you, if you have a form button, you wouldn't like the, the form to redirect to another page. So you can kind of hijack that click and do the same action that the browser would do except, leaving, except for leaving the page. And some other adaptive web design techniques that I used is the conditional loading. that It loads much more content if we are in a wider screen. And, and that's also based on some kind of conditional, in this case, the screen size. Um, yeah. And then on the server side, we have a um, kind of function that allows us to, ind so that indicates if we are, if the web, if the application is served from an API's perspective or a web perspective. And in my case, it's just uh, differentiating on the port number. And then for the flow, if we are in a web uh, world, we can redirect the user to the index page if we post, if we create a new bug, as I showed you. But then in the API perspective, we'd like to return some status code, which we can do because we know that we are in the API perspective here. And the same thing goes for uh, optimizing away CSS and JavaScript elements on the your, on your API side. Because you can just, this is kind of sloppy, but you can just have an if statement in your, in your templates or you can do it some, in a smarter way, of course. But it would be, it's, it's not so nice to give script and CSS elements to, a, for, to uh, API clients. You would like to have them optimized away. So, a summary uh, of my talk could be nice. So in the beginning, I told you about the growing number of connected physical devices, of the growing number of types of devices, the growing number of platforms, and the growing number of device models. And I kind of identified two problems, not new problems, but they are getting more and more important. And I think that we should start, start building HTML hypermedia APIs to make it easier for us to scale the development of native apps, both in terms of having the application flow on the server side, application logic, but also that you can kind of sheet and make secondary use cases just render their response in a web view. And then to use adaptive web design and progressive enhancement to make your web work on every browser, on every, de every device. And then that if you combine HTML hypermedia APIs and adaptive web design, you get a very nice combination. 
Um, and, and also, it is important to point out that these solutions are good in, in separate. So you can you choose only to use the HTML hypermedia APIs, or you can choose only to use adaptive web design. So that's perfect. But if you combine them, you will get something very powerful, I think. And as, as I just showed you, you can serve the APIs, API clients and the web from uh, the same um, endpoint with different URLs. And from a high level perspective, this is what it looks like. Native apps using the Perto principle, web browsers going to your, to your web, really simple HTML, minimal CSS, almost no, no JavaScript. And then you, ha you, progress advance you use progressive enhancement and adaptive web design to make better use experience for users with better browsers. And no application logic on the client side. All application logic should be on the server side. So I think we have some time for questions. And please wait for the microphone. Yeah, hi. Uh, exactly what part did Angular play in that demo? Um, it, it was when I made um, the screen wider, I loaded an Angular template so that every, every column that you saw was rendered by Angular. And the view model was kind of a, a list of bug states. Does it make it clear for you? You, um, yeah, you mean... Um, so what, I, if, if it's just an excuse for me to play around, play around with Angular, you can do in any web framework that you like. And as I, as I said, it's kind of an extreme example trying to show that you can have kind of a single page on top of a, of a mobile page. Okay. But, um, you, so yeah, I... I um, the, code, the code is actually on, um, on GitHub. So you can watch it for yourself. But um, so I kind of learning Angular here. So I probably made lots of mistakes. So and that's my fault, not Angular's fault. And do you have any view on uh, client side state in this kind of model? If you wanted to go mm. offline temporarily or yeah. in some sense. Offline is a really big challenge um, with this architecture. And it's kind of the opposite to what I just talked about, because with offline clients, you kind of have to have your, your application logic and your application state on the client. But then there's some other uh, kind of idea that would be nice for you to use. That you can have, if you kind of think of a client's backend, the data access layer, that part can actually be JavaScript. So you can have kind of a little application layer there if you want to. And then it's possible for you to, to a actually only have your application logic code in one code base and kind of make it. And then even the clients, the native clients could kind of load that on like every day. So you can kind of have an up updated application um, code on the clients. But it's kind of it's kind of not what I talk about here, and it's, I think that offline is it's a very nice concept, but I kind of doubt on, on, the, on the value of it when everything becomes just more and more connected. And it could be wise to ask yourself, why would you like offline, offline clients? And maybe for which use cases, at least. More questions? Hi. Hi. Um, as a server-side developer, I am quite often developing REST APIs, and those REST APIs are then consumed by, uh, let's say, a web application, and the same REST API is consumed by, um, let's say, iOS client. Now, how could I convince that the iOS guys who are developing the client code should use something else that is not the plain old JSON and stuff like that? 
Is there yeah. anything that I could just say that, okay, have a look, there is a ready-made solution that we can use this one yeah. endpoint? That's a, it's a good question um, because iOS is actually the platform that has the less support for parsing HTML. All the other platforms are pro probably are very good at it. Uh, but iOS is kind of the, the bad boy here. So it kind of depends on are you in control of the iOS development? Are you paying for it? Is it part of your organization? Or is it outside your organization? Because if it's inside your kind of economy, then it would make sense for, for someone coordinating all the applications and servers to minimize the cost for the system as a whole. So in that case, you would like to pull back all the application code back to the server. And, so, and then you will have a problem with the iOS developers because they don't really have a good way to parse HTML. And then you can kind of have a fallback to have the HTML parser on the server side just rendering JSON data, uh, the same kind of code that would be on the client, but instead you have it on the server and a kind of separate address. And then you're paying uh, some kind of price because you, then you need to have the application state on the iOS client. Um, and then if your client are just developed by someone else that you're not paying salary for, then it kind of the price you have to pay there is that there might not be as many clients on your API uh, if it's depending on... I mean, hypermedia APIs are, of course, a bit more data to work with. Um, and s s simple JSON APIs are much more simpler to, to access and start working with. The problem is that the application logic will be in the client. So it's always the trade-off, um, lots of trade-offs. Anything else? So I just want to say, this is my Twitter handle. Feel free to ask me more questions or discuss or anything. I'd love to, to discuss with you. And uh, if you want to access the, my demo here, it's on GitHub. And uh, I try to make the code better kind of each week. And don't, I, I've made all the mistakes. It's not AngularJS fault. Um, and if you want to access the, the slides on SlideShare, here's the URL for that. And there will also be access to, um, on the conference page, I think. Yes. Yes. So, thank you, Gustav. Yep. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>